Let's continue our series on the unshakables, shall we? So if you've been with us over the last few weeks, uh, we st- I think we've done three weeks now. I'm losing track. I'm getting old. Um, three weeks in this unshakable series. And what we're talking about is how to build your life on the unshakable foundation of Jesus. And then we talked about knowing our place in the story of the Bible or the story of God redeeming his people to him throughout the narrative of the Bible and the scriptures. And then we talked about last week, who, can, who remembers? Pop quiz, you get a cup of coffee for free after service. What was last week's? Surrender. surrender. There you go, Doc. Unshakable surrender. You get coffee. Yeah, I mean, everybody does. But <laughs> So we talked about the unshakable surrender that Jesus is both Lord and Savior, Lord or King and Messiah. Like We need to know his place in our life if we want to build this unshakable foundation. And this week, we're going to talk about unshakable direction, where we're headed, unshakable direction. And so I I watched this clip because I was looking for an illustration to, to do this, and I'm going to be honest, like I have daughters, but I haven't watched every Disney movie, but uh, a colleague said, hey, check out this, this is a great illustration, so I watched this clip. Have any of you ever seen Alice in Wonderland? Everybody's like, shh, don't, don't raise your hand. Um, so Alice in Wonderland, there's this part where she's, she's walking these trails, and you see it, there's just like little paths going everywhere, and there's this Cheshire cat sitting in the tree, and um, she basically comes up, she's like, which road do I take? Where do I go? And this cat says, well, where do you want to go? Where do you want to head? She says, I don't know. I don't know where I want to go. And what does the cat say? Then it doesn't matter which path you take. If you don't know where you're headed, where you want to go. If you don't know where you want to head, why does it matter which path you take? Just, just go. And then there's some weird, like, mystic. The cat disappears, and it's, there's just footprints going and all that. But that's not the point of the story. <laughs> I was on cough medicine when I watched that. So, um, but the point is, like, she's wandering, looking for something, and she says, "Man, which which path do I take?" And this wise, weird, creepy, striped cat says, "Well, where do you want to go?" She says, "I don't know." Well, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you don't know where you're headed. So, you guys may have heard this before, um, this this story if you've seen the movie. But the choices we make often are just kind of shotgunned, right? Like we we make these choices, we don't know where we're headed. But if we're gonna build this unshakable life on Jesus, we need to know the path on which we're traveling. We need to know where we're headed. So bad choices, poor decisions, poor paths, dangerous paths, places where we start heading down and we're like, you wanna hit the brakes? Like, oh, nope, shouldn't have taken that one. What do we do? when we find ourselves on the wrong path. That's the problem we run into. So we need to know where we're headed, but we also need to recognize when this path just isn't working. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. The Bible paints a picture of, being, of life being lived on a, in essentially two opposite directions. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, it says this, The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. So right off the bat, it says we have two paths, path of the righteous, path of the wicked. And no matter how complicated we want to make our story, our circumstances, and our lives, we find ourselves on one of these paths, path of the righteous, path of the wicked. It sounds oversimplified because as humans, and we talked about this in Ephesians, we really like to complicate things, right? We like to make it seem like, no, 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 but there's all these layers and nuances, and you don't understand all these things that are contributing to where I'm at and this decision I have to make. But in Proverbs here, it tells us that actually it's really straightforward. It's pretty binary. Either or. Righteous, wicked. Good or bad. Good or bad. So we're either pursuing a path of light, which is Jesus, or of darkness, or of darkness, So those are the two paths we're going to talk about today. And these are the two paths that we need to be aware of, know which one we're on as we pursue building this unshakable life. When we are on, (coughs) excuse me. So to begin to stay on the path of Jesus can often bring us to a place 
like we see Alice coming to, where, where am I going? Which path do I take? Which path do I take? We can experience moments like this. <clears throat> but the message of repentance, which we're talking about today, was the first foundational message that Jesus actually ever preached on in the book of Matthew and in the early church in the book of Acts. It was preached on this, meth- this message of repentance. Or when you find yourself on the wrong path, how do we turn around and get back going the right way? First teachings of Jesus and early on in the book of Acts, which if you're unfamiliar with the book of Acts, it's basically like Jesus goes away and his works continue through his apostles. So it's kind of like the acts of Jesus after his resurrection is what we can look at it as. And so this is the establishing of the early church, the planting of the early church, kind of like we find ourselves in. So we're not the early church, but it's the beginning stages of a church. So there's a lot of correlations that we can identify with. So the ident- the uh, This whole idea of changing directions and finding the right path is called repentance. Repentance. And that's what we're going to unpack today because repentance is key for the life of the Jesus follower. Repentance. What does that mean? That's a big word. That's a Bible word. Like if you're new to church, like, okay, repentance. I hear people talking about this. I heard a guy with a sign yelling to repent or you're going to burn. Or I saw a sign on campus with this guy talking about repentance. It's another one of those ones that there may be some baggage attached to for us, right? Like we need to have a working definition of what this means. Matthew 4.17, it says this. From the time Jesus began to preach, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. We need to turn away from all the things that are engulfing us and drawing us further and further into this world because the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom is near. So what repentance practically means is a change of your mind and your heart over sin resulting in a fresh direction from sin and towards Jesus. So it's a changing of all these different things inside of us. It's a change. It's a changing of path. It's a changing of direction. It's acknowledging where I'm going, not good, where do I need to head, and then some things happen inside of us. Now, these things don't just happen on our own strength, on our own power, on our own willpower. We can't just strong arm them and make them happen. This is where the transformative power of Christ and his Holy Spirit working in our lives and being in community comes into effect. But today, I do want to unpack a few practical things we can do, or at least be aware of, that are a part of this repentance thing. So this change that we want to talk about today has an inward aspect and an outward aspect. And we need to talk about both of those. So it's, it's really hard for us as humans. And it's really hard for me as a, as a married man to admit when I'm wrong. It's something that, that I don't like to readily do. Um, if Brie was here today, she would probably be shaking her head in agreement. Um, but... It's just something that we're programmed as humans to to know, or by our society at least, to know, here's what I believe, here's why I believe it, and we're going to be stubborn. Even when we may be doing the wrong thing, it's like, well, now I'm going to look kind of foolish if I change my mind or if I admit I'm wrong. So we, we get more rooted in our stubbornness. But even when we know we're wrong, we try to find a way to be right in our wrongness. You guys ever experienced that? Like, I know I'm wrong, but now i got to find a caveat to this that I can still stand on and say, but actually I'm right about this part of where I'm actually overall wrong. Is that making sense? Kind of. So our brains, at least mine and some friends of mine who I've processed this with, we get so twisted and caught up in desiring to be right that we even when we know we're wrong, we still try to find something in that that we can hold on to. Something in that that we can hold on to. We try to justify it. We try to minimize it. We try to shift blame. We try to shift ownership of what's happening that's wrong. We try to shift that stuff and all the wrongdoing. Now, this is not a unique thing to any one person. This is not just your friend that you don't like to talk to anymore because they always blame shift and they never admit they're wrong. It's not just that person. It's actually all of us. It's a piece of our fallen nature. Blame shifting. We see it in the garden, right? The woman that you gave to me made me eat of the apple. We see this from the very beginning. From the time the fallen nature that sin entered the world, we see this blame shifting, trying to justify in our wrongness where we know we're wrong. We still try to justify it and prove that things are right. And if this, if this is bringing something on, you're like, oh yeah, I can see where I've done this, or I can see where my significant other, or family members, or whoever else have done this, we have to start out by admitting that we all do this to some degree. We can't put this off as everybody else's issue, 
This isn't just your daddy's issue. This isn't just your sibling's issue. This isn't just your ex whatever's issue. Like this is a human issue that we have to deal with. We have to. Because the problem is, unless we learn to deal with our sin properly, to actually deal with it, we just become experts in covering it up. We just become experts in covering it up. And that's not a good thing. I know that there was a point in time in my life where like, that was really good news, that I was really good at covering up my sin. So when I was away at college, my parents didn't know exactly what was up because I could put on a good face. I could tell them what they wanted to hear. I could justify things in my own head to make it seem like I wasn't actually lying, but I just became really good at covering up my sin. And if we don't acknowledge wrong for wrong and call it what it is, we just become professionals at deception and covering things up. And that's not where we want to head. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So covering up your sins, you don't prosper. But by confessing them, we actually find mercy. We find the very thing we need to help us out of this pit. So how does repentance work? Repentance involves a change of mind and heart over sin that results in change. So it results in changing of our mind, changing of our heart, and then there's a fruit of that. We see change. There's evidence of change. So we're going to look at each of these aspects briefly to see how this whole thing works. How does repentance work? How do I turn from whatever I'm doing, however I'm living that's not right, whatever's taking me down the path of wickedness, and how do I get going the right direction towards Jesus? So first, it says that it's a change of mind. Luke 15, 17 says this, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Repentance begins when the truth confronts our conscience, when we have to actually realize, man, I messed up. This isn't good. This isn't taking me in the good direction. And it's acknowledgement of our sin. So this is how repentance starts, a change of mind. In this story, this parable of the lost son, he's going off, he takes his inheritance, he's partying, there's all kinds of things that we could correlate with today's world, but basically takes his share of his father's inher- or of his inheritance from his father, and he goes and blows it. And he ends up just begging for food from the troughs of pigs, basically, at farms to get by. And he comes to this realization, he's like, man, my father's servants eat better than I do. What have I done? Out of my pride and arrogance and entitlement, I have squandered everything, disgraced my family, and I find myself way more lowly than the very servants that I used to observe working for my father. The reality and conviction had to confront his conscience, as we see here. This is kind of a little come-to-Jesus moment, if you will. I like how that works out, don't you? Where you have to acknowledge what I'm doing, it's not working. It's taking me further from healthy relationship, further from family. It's eating me up from the inside out. It's destroying who I once was, who God has called me to be, who my loved ones know me to be. It's destroying that, and something needs to change. That happens in our conscience. That happens in our mind. That's the first thing. <clears throat> you might say the first step is admitting that you have a problem. It's kind of like that. You got to admit it. Change of mind. The second thing is we experience a change of heart. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. You see, it's not enough just to, just to acknowledge sin. We can't just acknowledge that we have a problem and do nothing about it. <coughs> Repentance happens when we acknowledge that we have a problem and we actually grieve over it. Like, man, this is not good. Like, this breaks my heart that I am basically crucifying Jesus all over again with my sin that time and time again, I turn from what I know is right, what I know is good, and pursue my own selfish ways. And yeah, I I beat myself up about it because I know it's not good, but I still continue to do it. We have to do something about it. We have to grieve or be sorrowful for our sin, like it says here. It needs to get to our emotions, to the emotional level. It can't just be head knowledge. What have you ever experienced that's changed your life that was just head knowledge? 
Not much, right? Like it may change your behavior or modify like your thoughts for a day, but then you go right back. If something doesn't actually get your emotions and tell you like at the depths of your soul what's wrong and what's going on and why you need to change, it's just easy to wake up the next day and forget about. So we need to acknowledge it. We need to grieve over it. It needs to get to the emotional level. We need to have, if you will, an acute level of sadness about the state we find ourselves in. For me, that looked like being on my knees in tears, not knowing how I was going to get up. Not knowing how I was going to get up. I got, it's that I got nothing moment, right? I got nothing. I've screwed up, broken relationship. Sin has just polluted, like, Every, every bit of my life, like I don't know who's a real friend, who really cares, who's just trying to get what they can from me, but you have to feel that at an emotional level, and it leaves us vulnerable, it leaves us feeling unprotected, but it's necessary because those walls need to break down before somebody can come in and rescue, right? We got to break down those walls before something can happen. Godly grief involves true sorrow over our sin Producing the kind of life change that we need. Godly grief involves this sorrow. Therefore, producing the change we need. And then the third step is there's got to be evidence of this change. We can't just talk about it. We can't just shed some tears and feel guilty and shameful because that leads us nowhere. That just is an avenue for the enemy to come in and beat us down and keep us in that, right? To isolate us. But there's evidence of change. We see a little bit of this in Acts chapter 26. If you have your Bible or app, you can follow along. Acts 26, verse 20. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. And then in Matthew 3, it says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. There's evidence, it says, and demonstrate the repentance by their deeds or produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is not just this little thing internally that happens and nobody notices. If you've been around this community long enough, you've got to see some people experience this repentance in their lives because their stories are pretty awesome. And you've seen it in baptisms, all this different stuff. Like you see the fruit of repentance. You see the fruit of like, no, no, no. This is who you were, and now you're going this way. Like, you completely have turned from where you were going. And I see it. I can't ignore it. Like, that's repentance. That's what it is. It's not like, oh, you seem like you smile more. Like, no, we see, we see change. We see radical things happen because we serve a radical God who radically transforms people from the inside out. You don't just go tell someone, like, hey, I repented. And they're like, really? <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way. We see the evidence of change. We see the fruit. You don't say that's an apple tree, but there's pears hanging from it. Like you can judge it by its fruit. You see, man, this person has changed the direction in their life. And I see it by the way they live, conduct their relationships, pursue other relationships, and speak of their life and their direction now. That's what comes out of repentance. That's what comes out of it. Repentance is to be a way of life. For the, for the follower of Jesus. It's a way of life that we see fruit. <clears throat> we know this because true repentance takes place when there's an evidence of change in our lives. When there's an evidence of change. So being a way of life, what does that mean? Repentance is not a one-time thing. This is a tough one. Because a lot of times we see, like we hear about in church, a conversion moment, right? Like, man, I was, I was acting a fool. I was doing this. I was living in my sin. And then everything changed. And then everything was great from then on. Like, no, 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 no. That's not how it's, that's not how I've experienced it necessarily. I think that paints kind of a poor picture. Like following Jesus and repenting is something that we have to do on the daily, on the hourly. (laughs) Every time we see ourselves starting to go down that path of wickedness, where we're thinking ill thoughts about somebody, where we're being selfish and prideful. Each moment requires repentance and turning from those intentionally to Jesus. 
It's not a one-time thing. It's not like going into, you buy a new home, you go to State Farm, and they're not paying me to say that, and you buy your, your fire insurance and you're good, and you don't have to worry till the next year when your premium comes up again. No, 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 no. This isn't just some insurance policy that, whew, got that taken care of. This is a lifestyle, a way of life for the follower of Jesus, is that daily we identify the ways in which we are straying from God, we intentionally turn from those, and we chase after him. It's a redirection, 180 degree, turning from whatever is opposite of the things that are taking us away from Jesus. Whatever is exact opposite of the things that would try to keep us from walking the righteous path, we pursue those instead. We pursue those instead. The reason that we can't just make this a one-time thing is as we grow as Jesus followers, as we experience more life within this spiritual family thing, within church, we experience a growing need to get rid of selfishness, to get rid of pride. We experience people that are messy, and we need to repent for the way in which we interact with them, for the thoughts that go through our head. Because just because you choose to be a part of a church and follow Jesus does not mean that everybody's got their stuff together. Amen? That's not how it works. Do not come to church hoping for a safe little sanctuary bubble where you're not going to have to deal with messy people and issues and rudeness and hurt and pain. This is not heaven. This is a church. This isn't heaven. You're still going to mess with people that might say something that offend you. The pastor might say something that offends you from stage. He may have an off week and you don't feel as tickled by his message. <laughs> the worship, like you... Stuff is going to happen. This is church. And it requires us as we get deeper and deeper into this spiritual family thing, it requires more and more repentance. It's like the fine tuning of a tool or a machine. As your work becomes more and more precise, there's more and more calibration that needs to happen, right? When you're doing fine tuning, the calibration is so much more important. And as we get more into this following Jesus thing, like we start to notice when things get off a little sooner. And it's, it requires us to continually do that, to, to follow Jesus, not to be some like perfectly managed moral person, not to get us self-righteous saying like, look at me, I served, I put my envelope in the black box because I do it old school, Matt. And like, and all the, it's not about people seeing you do things. It's about a heart to avoid the sorrow and grief that sin places deep down in our souls and pursue Jesus instead. And as we go along, the pendulum hopefully swings less and less from side to side and we reach more of a middle ground, but it's still, we're still gonna vacillate. We're still gonna experience like that voice in your head saying something that's not so nice about somebody. Hopefully it stays in your head. <clears throat> You're still gonna experience frustration as a parent or as a spouse or with a coworker, like these things are still going to happen and they're going to require us to say, okay, how would Jesus interact with me in this moment? And what would he call me to do? Like I talked about last week, it starts to change the way you talk about people or your kids as a parent, which was my example. Like there's certain things I just stopped saying to my kids to correct them because I just like heard the echo from my heavenly father saying the same thing to me, like, oh yeah, I told you that one seven times yesterday, Chris, how's that going? Why don't you just listen to me? Why don't you just like... (laughs) Right? We experience those things. We never stop repenting. We can't. We can't. Living a lifestyle of repentance should not be confused with beating ourselves up, talking down about ourselves, like, man, they probably think I'm a piece of trash because I did that, or I bet they they probably know that I had this thought, and so they probably don't want to be around me, so I'm just going to isolate myself. No, 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 no. That's not what repentance is. That's actually selfishness because it's focused on the self. Repentance is like, man, praise God that I have the opportunity right now to turn from this sin and this mess that's trying to creep into my head and chase after Jesus. Praise God that he came and gave his life for me so that I have the opportunity to not dwell and loathe in this junk and that I can actually pursue him and he can pull me out of this. That's what repentance is. 
It's not beating yourself up. It's that Jesus lifts you up out of that as you turn to him. As you turn to him. But you got to turn to him. You got to say, hey, help. Need your help. Let's, like, get me out of this. I want to come to you. I want to come to you. Like, I am way stronger than my one and a half year old, but when she won't turn to me and she runs away from me, it is really hard to actually lift her up and get her to cooperate. And I imagine there's at least a similar like difference between God and me and me and my one and a half year old. Like he's probably a lot stronger than me like I am than Brindley. And if I'm running away from him, running away and he's just, no, just come to me. It's going to be a, like hard for him to actually do something with me. No, he's God. He could, but he require, or he, he desires love from us. So he chooses to have us turn to him. When she turns to me, daddy, help. I'm stuck. Help pick her up and get her to safety and I can help show her how to successfully and appropriately navigate whatever trial or whatever little thing she ran into next time. How many of us in this room right now are not living a lifestyle of daddy help with our heavenly father, the only one who can pull us out of the pits of despair and depravity and depression that we find ourselves in for a lot of us in here, probably on a daily basis. When we hear those voices, or maybe they're people, maybe they're not just voices in your head, maybe they're people, when we're hearing these things that are telling us, like, you have nothing to offer, you messed up too much, you missed your opportunity, you know what, they don't want nothing to do with you, because they might find out, they might find out. When we're hearing those voices, that's when we need to reach out and reach up. Daddy. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, Lord and Messiah, King, the one with the power to actually deal with everything we're experiencing, and Savior, the one with the heart and compassion to reach down and pull us out of these pits, help. Help. Help me turn from that and turn to you. Help. How many of us in this room has it been way too long since we've said help? How many of us are too dang prideful to ask for help and turn, even though we know that it's wrong, but we try to justify the wrongs, like, yeah, that may be wrong, but you know what, like, but, but it's still, there's this part that's okay, so I'm just going to keep doing this. Like, I know it's wrong to get wasted every night, but like, it's Oregon and microbreweries are so good, and so I still got to go hang out there because that's what we do in the Northwest. I just, I really like to play some blackjack every now and then. And yeah, I only intended to drop 50 bucks and I ended up dropping 200. Like, but it's, it's still, it's just cards. But I love her and I think I'm going to marry her. So why does it matter if I'm sleeping with her? I might marry her someday. No, stop. Those are not healthy. Those are not godly. That is not the path of the righteous. That is the pack of the wi- or pack, path of the wicked. You're trying to find excuses within your wrongness to make it seem right. And it's not. It's not right. We, as Jesus followers and his family, have to stop trying to excuse all the junk in our lives and recognize that we need help. We do. And I know that doesn't feel nice. And it's not fun to think about. And it requires change. And let's be honest, who likes change? Who likes it? Because sometimes, most of the time, the very thing we need to change and turn from is quite fun in the moment. It may be fun on Friday night, Saturday night. But when you wake up the next morning, you have to look in the mirror and realize that you're settling, selling yourself short, and you're not pursuing becoming the person that God desires you to be, that he created you to be in his image. That's a lot of times where we avoid looking in that mirror, don't we? It's just not fun. It's just not fun. We have to turn from these things, family. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, the apostle says, Dear children, Keep yourself from idols. What's an idol? An idol is something that receives your worship that is not God. An idol can look like cash in your wallet, can look like numbers in a bank account, can look like a pretty girl or handsome guy on campus, can look like toys, 
can look like a website that you shouldn't be going to at all, much less frequenting. It can look like trying to receive your worth and your security and significance from another person, another human. Those are all idols. It says to keep ourselves, the Bible, the word of God, his apostles, the ones he entrusted to establish his church, who he told you will do even greater works than I have done. One of those guys says, dear children, keep yourself from idols. They're no good. Stop pursuing things other than God. Stop trusting in things other than him. Stop trusting in a bank account or a job or a social status to save you from the things you're dealing with. Because it may seem like it's working right now, but I promise you, it's going to leave you in a really bad place. In a really bad place. When it comes down to this repentance thing, the issue that we have to deal with, and we see this happening time and time again in the scriptures, the issue that God is concerned about, the issue that we avoid dealing with is the issue of our heart, the issue of our souls, where our heart is directed, what receives our worship, our affection, and our attention. It's a heart issue. God wants our hearts. Each of you in here, No matter how many times it's been broken, how fractured you feel it may be, how many times maybe you've given it out on a plate to someone unjustifiably, he still desires it. In fact, he's the one that can fix it, that can make it whole, that can renew it. He gives you, the Bible says, he gives you a new heart. Where you had a heart of stone, he gives you a heart of flesh. He brings renewal, rejuvenation, and empowerment into your life where you feel like all you have is a pile of mush that's been used and stomped on time and time again. He takes that and he gives you a new one. I find that to be extremely great news. I've experienced that. I have friends and family and people in this room that I've got to see experience that. And there is nothing like the life that it will bring to a community, to a family, and to an individual person to get that heart transplant. To turn from the wickedness and the ways of sin that root us in idolatry and chasing after things that are just temporary to chasing the one thing that has eternal purpose and hope in our lives. You see, this repentance thing, it seems like a weakness thing. The word says, where we are weak, he is strong. The work of Jesus is perfected where we are weak. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm fine being weak sometimes. Because it allows God to show up in a mighty way and do things that I could never fathom or strong arm or manipulate into reality on my own. He has much better plans for us than what we try to make happen in our own worlds. Much better plans. Just because you go to church, you read your Bible, and maybe raise a hand during worship does not mean you are immune to these idols of the heart. You are not immune. They are very real, they are subversive, they shape shift and try to crawl their way into your lives through other people, through other things that are going on. We have to be aware that as humans in our current situation, we have a propensity to grab onto these idols. We just do. But we don't have to be victim to them. That's the good news I want to share with you guys today. We don't have to be victim to these things. We don't have to be victim to a broken heart. We don't have to be victim to sin. Like Jesus took to turn us from victims, here you go, into victors. He did that for us. We don't have to sit there and beat ourselves up and be hopeless. Like, no, he turned us from victims to victors. Like, this is great news, but we just need to get on the right team. We just need to get on the right team. You can't claim the Super Bowl ring if you're playing for for Cleveland, right? And this is NBA. You're like, what? Cleveland won? No, this is football. You can't claim it if you're not on the winning team. If you're not on the team that was the victors that won the Super Bowl, like, you can't claim that. You can't go, like, make up some ring. No, you, you don't have stake in that. 
Jesus' team won. That's the team that we need to side with. That's the team we need to pursue. That's what we need to do. Victors. So the question that I ask you guys here today, and this is a very real question. This isn't just some nice like rhetorical, like, oh, I'm going to go think about that in a couple of weeks. Like, no, this is something I want you to think about right now. Are you happy with the path your life is on? Are you happy with the path your life is on? Is it heading the direction it should be? Do you know for certain that the direction you're pursuing will lead you to the fulfillment your heart longs for? Do you know where you're headed? Is where you're headed going to get you what you desire? Do you know what your end game is? Or are you just in survival mode? Are you just in survival mode? Following Jesus means making a pretty radical change in your life. I promise you it's the best change you'll ever make. I won't say it's going to get easier, but it's going to get better. It's going to be more meaningful. It's going to take you in the right path. It's going to bring eternal life. It's going to bring relationship with the God who created you. It's going to bring security and significance into your lives where you've been looking for it in other ways and other people and other things. Radical change in your life. So I want to, uh, worship team, you guys can head back up. Except me. <clears throat> I want to give you guys the opportunity to identify the path that you desire to choose. Repentance means changing of mind, right? Acknowledging we have a problem. Yep. Something needs to change. Then a changing of our heart. God help. My heart needs radically changed. This doesn't work anymore. I need something different. Change me from in here, please. And then evidence of it. <clears throat> something has to happen between two, or th- two and three, steps two and three. Something has to happen. Our mind and our heart, they change. But to see evidence of it, we have to actually invite other people in. Say, hey, I need help. I want to turn to Jesus, but I may not know how. Will you pray for me? Will you talk through this with me? Can I go to you when I'm struggling, when I have problems, and will you help me through this? And guess what? That other person's going to have some problems that you're going to get to help them with too. We have to do something about it though. Church, this has to go beyond head knowledge, and it has to go into practical, like applicable steps towards following Jesus. We can't just sit in a seat any longer and hope things change. Help. Help. Sooner or later, you're going to be there. I would much rather you be there right now, today, than when you're alone in a destructive position somewhere where you might do harm to yourself because you're depressed and you just don't know where to go. This is a safe practical place to say, I need to repent, I need to turn from my mess, and I need Jesus to direct my ways. I need his path. So as we wrap up with worship, what we're going to do is we're going to have some life group leaders and some people around the room. If that's you, and you're like, man, I need to turn from this. I need to get right with Jesus. I need to get on the path of the light and not the path of the darkness. Like I, I, want, I want you to get up out of your seat during worship, and I want you to go find someone that's standing around the room and tell them, I need to repent, and let them walk through that with you. Let them pray for you. Let yourself feel that emotion, the weight of like, man, what I'm doing brings sorrow to my heart. It brings conviction. Feel that weight so that you can feel the full lightness that comes when Jesus takes that for you and from you. Feel the gravity of what you're currently experiencing so you can like, appreciate the victory as you give that to him. But do not leave here today just dwelling in that, beating yourself up. Don't leave here today without dealing with the condition of sin that's in your life. 
That doesn't mean you're broken. That doesn't mean you're less than anybody else. It means you're actually brave and you actually need a savior, which all of us do. And you're just admitting it because you know that your life, your family's life, your children, your future children, your entire legacy is going to be radically changed because of the path you choose to be on. That's great news. This doesn't just affect us. This affects marriages, children, legacies, workplaces, entire towns, cities, and campuses where we interact. Like This is the transformation that our world desperately needs. Desperately needs. And we all get to be those agents of change, but first we need to give up our junk to the Lord. Let him take it. Get us on the right path so that we can fully engage in what he calls us to. Amen? So Matt's going to come up here. He's going to pray for you guys. And I just, I really urge you, like, take this moment. Get prayer. Deal with your stuff. Don't leave here carrying that heavy burden, that backpack. That's not yours. It's his to deal with. And it's just going to weigh you down and keep you off the path. Get right with Jesus today so that you can help others do the same tomorrow. Amen.